one of the things as I started, if I think back to when I started thinking through contextualizing embodied solidarity for, you know, um, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen Z, who are the people that I teach, I'm a Gen X and I teach millennials and Gen Z, yeah. social justice is really sexy. Um, people get kudos that um, if you don't know the nomenclature, kids call it, the kids call it virtue signaling. You get to signal that you're virtuous online by retweeting certain things like Black Lives Matter or you can even show that you donated. Whether or not you want to, a lot of apps won't allow you to hide yourself. But sometimes you don't even know because they just assume you want credit publicly, right? So I, I think that for many, it depends on who you are. Because for many of us, clicking like, posting something on Twitter, like on Facebook, clicking like on Facebook, posting something on Twitter, um, doing an Instagram TV live video from a protest is not going to get us fired. For some of us, it will. Um, that's, that's risky solidarity, right? Um, but for most of us, I, I call that low-hanging fruit. Um, voting can be a form of embodied solidarity with other citizens for people for whom it's a costly, very costly political act. And those are mostly our poor black and brown, you know. And so I, I just want to be clear that I think online virtual forms of solidarity can be risky, but for most of us, they're not. So I'm not primarily talking about social media, although it's ironic that my post was online, certainly subject to being mistaken not read in terms of its intent, but that's the risk we all take on social media. Um, so yeah, I, I'm mostly thinking about other things, but I do think that for some people, social media can be a place where they begin. You know, I don't think that should be the end though. So I, I wanna build um, more on this. Um, again, watching the movie this morning, I was struck, uh, I started thinking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, Bonhoeffer, who was a, a German Christian theologian um, and a, a leader who died um, uh, under, under the Nazi regime. And he has a, um, a famous book called, translated into English, uh, called the, the, the Cost of Christian Discipleship. Um, and in particular, what's often sort of pulled out of Bonhoeffer is that there's a distinction between cheap grace and costly grace um, that he, he spells out. Um, and it, that, that concept has shaped a lot of 20th century and 21st century Christian thinkers. And so I'm wondering if you could sort of push that further and, and talk a little bit more about kind of cheap solidarity and costly solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, as concepts and how they relate to both your own experience and your thinking about this concept. Yeah. I, um, so I, I want to be clear that um, I think that the cost of embodied solidarity, just like a product on the market, and I hate using examples from capitalism, but I'm going to, um, is all relative. Um, the price point is relative. The market is in flux, right? So it's elastic. It's price elastic because protesting on the street, to use an example from right now, um, for many Black people, they risk their life, not their livelihood, they risk their life to march on the streets. So this goes back to my students. For my white students at University of Virginia who come from what's called Nova in this area, um, Northern Virginia, um, perhaps you guys have caught on to that up in Baltimore. A lot of my students are from Nova, which means their parents work for government, they're fairly wealthy, they might be ambassadors kids, um, went to the same high schools where, um, you know, Sidwell friends and other kinds of places. Um, Marching in the streets for my white students whose own bodies betray that privilege, right? Um, versus my black students who are just seen as black, right? 
it's a very different cost. It's a very different price. Um, it's a very different cost and price for my black students during, um, from 2017 to now, I had a student graduate a year ago. Um, and I'm, I'm referring to what we call in Charlottesville, the summer of hate, the summer that unite the right, e.g. Mm -hmm. um, neo-Nazis, anti-Semites, um, white supremacists came to town in large numbers from our town and from other places. I had students who basically put their schoolwork on a second tier at an elite university because the call to do justice was heavy upon them because white folks in Charlottesville weren't showing up with and for them. And white students at UVA, in some cases, not in all cases, weren't putting their bodies on the line. So my students of color were putting their GPAs on the line because they felt the time was ripe for justice. Now, some of them still went to Harvard for med school and grad school and other things, um, but it's a call, it's a, there's a differential price. And so when I'm marching in the streets, I nod to my black brothers and sisters. I affirm and esteem, especially the young ones, because they're doing something that they know can cost them their lives because they've lived their entire lives on social media and seen young black and brown and poor white kids killed just like them for the color of their skin, not for doing any particular thing, but existing in their skin. So when I say the cost of embodied solidarity differs, um, race is one of the, the differentiating factors. Religion, for my Muslim friends, for my sisters in the hijab, um, wearing the hijab is a costly act of religious devotion. And so um, for my Muslim sisters to march in the hijab in the street, and I saw someone do that last week, it's costly, it's costly. So, the, and, I, and I can't put a price point on what it costs for you, because what it costs for you, Heather, as a PhD with two young children, one of whom I met, is different than other people, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's not a, you know, there's not, and it's hard, that makes it difficult because students often want to know, they want the answer, like, what does it look like for me? You know, some, you know, people want the answer, not just students. Um, we all want people to lay things out, but it, it, but it relates to, I'm a black woman and I can't tell you how to decolonize your mind, how to root, it, root out white supremacy that's deeply embedded in you. If it's deeply embedded in me, it's deeply embedded in you. And so I can't tell you, you got to figure it out. And it requires deep soul work, really knowing one's self and pressing into our own fears in some cases. Um, for some people, it's not the fear that keeps them from embodying solidarity, it's something else. Um, so. Going, going off of that, the concept of deep soul work, I think one of the things that's made reference to the film but really isn't developed is that you understood wearing hijab as, as part of your advent devotion, um, which I thought was a beautiful thing to reflect on and I'd love to hear more on. And for those who are on the call and are not kind of familiar with the uh, Christian calendar, advent is the season um, leading up to Christmas when Christians around the world prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus, right? And so, I mean, and in, in, again, playing with this, this as an Advent devotion, it's when Christians believe that God became incarnate, God became embodied. Um, and so understanding your embodied solidarity as part of your Advent devotion, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that and, and sort of the soul work that you did um, in that season in 2015 and are continuing to do. Yeah, um, being, being an academic, um, the season for you know Hanukkah, um, Christmas is always it's it's intense, right? I'm 
giving, I'm wrapping up the school year. And then within a week, I'm administering exams or reading 60 research papers that are 20 or 30 pages long. And my students are like, well, that's your fault, you know, because you assigned it. <laughs> but, um, but that's my life around that time. Yeah. And so I either finish that and then fly to Oklahoma to visit my family from Chicago when my, and my sister wants me to go shopping with her or I don't finish and I bring it home with me and I'm up into the middle of the night and I'm the, I'm the designated gift wrapper. So I'm always up until 1 a, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. on Christmas Eve slash Christmas morning yeah. wrapping gifts, you know, so it's a time that since I've been in academia, um, it's been hard to have a spiritual focus, which sounds weird because for even for, for low church Christians, meaning, you know, um, not Catholic, not Episcopal, um, where we don't light candles for Advent, um, where we didn't really grow up knowing what Advent was because for a lot of people in the South, that's, that's a, they say that's a Catholic thing, um, that I wanted to be intentional in the same way that around Easter, a lot of you may be familiar with the tradition of Lent, where um, Christians enter into a 40-day um, sort of um, spiritual devotion akin to a fast, um, taking on spiritual disciplines or, you know, kind of giving up um, habits and or both, um, I wanted to, my Advent to be similarly focused during that very intense time for me as an academic. And so those two ideas came together. Um, I wish that it was, it was inspired. I, 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 it wasn't, I mean, I want to say, oh, I had this outline of like what I was going to put in that Facebook post. I didn't. I just thought if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to wear a hijab, it needs to be a spiritual practice because this is who I am. Um, I had also consulted with Muslim friends um, in the, at the Council on American Islamic Relations in Chicago. Um, so I was thinking about how do I honor this concept, the spiritual devotion of hijab? It's also a spiritual devotion. Um, and so it wasn't a syncretism as much as a, how can I wear this intentionally? This isn't a social experiment. This is a spiritual practice for me. And so um, that's what I did. And it was, it was very meaningful as a way for me to reflect more deeply on um, that, what you mentioned as the embodiment of Jesus. And we think of this baby in a manger yeah. in songs, in pictures, in crushes and crush scenes, you know, the manger scenes are called crush scenes. Um, and, and it's not, Christians don't believe that it's just this docile baby. Um, we think that Jesus in his life embodies the most radical form of solidarity with humanity, which is to ultimately journey to, you know, the road to Golgotha, the cross, um, and to die in solidarity with the most despised and rejected of his time. Women, widows, orphans, lepers, prisoners. He was a prison abolitionist, set the captives free. Um, kind of spiritual, like, nuts, his cousin, John the Baptist, you know, kind of out in the wilderness doing his thing. Like, that that's the kind of solidarity, again, based in the Sermon on the Mount, this notion of walking a mile in your neighbor's shoes. That's what, that's one, one piece, one critical piece of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and yes, I think it's a political manifesto, but it's also just patently, again, who we're supposed to be. So I don't think of it as primarily um, spiritual or primarily political. I just think of it as both simultaneously. And so for me, the incarnation of the Jesus and the movement that it spawns is significant. And I think it's significant for people who don't believe in the literal resurrection of the Jesus, um, for people who don't necessarily, 
maybe grew up in a Christian tradition, people who are not Christians of other religions who think of Jesus as a good prophet, a good teacher, rabbi. Um, I think that the reason that we think so is because who he was from the writings that we have um, and, and the kind of band of followers who then, you know, embodied solidarity in similar ways, right? Willing to stand up to the ultimate power, the power of the state, the power of the Roman Empire. And so that's the narrative that I was trying to embody humbly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's who I want to be um, as a political scientist, as a human. So. Um, there, there's two, there's at least, I two, arguably three more questions, and then I, I want to turn to some of the chat and engage the audience with, with their questions. Um, the first one, and, and you just brought up your um, consultation with the Council on American Islamic Relations. And I know this was a question that um, folks in the ICJS community were really interested in, which is what was your sort of relationship or engagement with Muslims leading up to December 2015, and what's been your experience and relationship with Muslims uh, since then? Yeah, so growing up in Oklahoma, I, when I was young, before I went to college, I had no Muslim friends. Um, when I went to graduate school, um, two members of my cohort were Muslim, one Shia, one Sunni. We had lots of great conversations, um, or I got to sit in on a lot of their, like, arguments. I mean, they were the best of friends. It was, um, you know, and I was there, I was there like practicing Christian friend, right? I went to, um, I went to the Friday prayers once with them during, um, during Ramadan. Um, and in Norman, Oklahoma, there was a very small, um, kind of house off campus. There was, there was no mosque. Um, well, well no building, like a mosque is where the people are, right? But um, that was where they would go to pray. Very, it was very close to the dorms. The old dorms where my parents lived when my parents went to the University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they were my closest Muslim friends. Um, then when I was working at Wheaton, I've already mentioned the Faith Labor Action Board and that it was ecumenical. Um, I had two very close Muslim friends on, serving on the board there with me. Um, two men, again. Um, one, um, Nation of Islam, black Muslim from Chicago, grew up in Chicago, converted um, from Christianity, like me. He grew up in a similar tradition to mine. Um, and, the, and so he was um, the government relations director at the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, and part of what I teach, I said political science, but I teach at the intersection of race, ethnicity, religion, and politics. That's my research, my teaching. So when I taught a class called Religion and Politics, I would have my friend, Gerald, come from the Council on American Islamic Relations because he's the government relations director and talk about um, the, ver the varieties of expressions of Islam and how they intersect with politics very differently. That it's not monolithic, just like I said, the black church isn't a monolith and expressions of Islam are not either. Um, and so, Gerald had been to my class on two occasions, taught the entire class at Wheaton College. So I had invited Muslim brothers and sisters to speak before. Um, and my other friend is Halil Demir, who runs what's called, um, and excuse my Arabic, the, the Zakat Foundation of America. Um, so one of the approved uh, Muslim alms organizations. And so Halil, Gerald and I were, were good friends um, for years on the board. And so when I was thinking about this, and just to back up very briefly, this is a different strand that I'm not going to go into. It was a student who approached me in the very beginning. You probably, if you saw the film, you saw that, about wearing the hijab. And so I said, let me call my friends at the Council on American Islamic Relations and ask, you know, is this considered... I didn't use the words cultural appropriation, but that's, that's what people often ask. Is this, I thought, is this haram? Is this considered defiling? Is this unclean? Mm -hmm. Like, because that would be the, the, like, then that would be the wrong way to call attention 
to the suffering of our sisters and brothers, right? So as women, we were going to do it through attention to our sisters who are more visible, um, women who are in hijab, more visible adherents of, of Islam, right? So um, that's how I, that's why I connected with them. And they consulted with the women in the organization. So it wasn't just the men making the decision and any Muslim man will tell you that, um, uh, that they consulted with the women in the organization and the board of the Chicago Council on American Islamic Relations said, yeah. And when, and when your students get back and you get back from Christmas wearing the hijab, most of them were just gonna wear it on the airplane home um, from holiday break and back. And we were gonna have a panel discussion. We were going to make it educational, bring Muslim women who wear hijab, who don't wear hijab, who cover, who don't cover in whatever ways and talk about experiences and Islamophobia. And so um, that was my relationship with the Muslim community in Chicago and when I was in grad school before in Oklahoma. Thank you. That's great. Uh, it's a, a preview. I think one of the questions that was coming in was the, the question of cultural appropriation. So I would imagine it's one that you've fielded a lot. So thank you for addressing it. Right away. Um, the other thing I want to talk about you is, is, is specifically your, the, how uh, race and bodies play into your thinking and how they can play into this moment. And I, I wanted to, to, to quote the film directly. I think one of your colleagues asked what was a really provocative question in the film. When a black woman who was raised in the African-American Christian tradition for generations speaks, does white suburban evangelicalism understand what she's saying? And the framing of that question by your colleague really struck me in the film. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the sort of race and bodies conversation within the Christian tradition and um, how you've experienced the, the, the racial divides in that, in that environment. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is his answer is that's what we mean by systemic racism. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my favorite quotes in the film because, I mean, he's a theologian. <laughs> so it makes me laugh. I was like, he's not a sociologist. He sounded like one in that moment, but um, he's one of my best friends um, on the faculty at Wheaton. And the experience of um, being embodied, I mean, what I didn't know is, you know, you look back over your life and it's easier to have that hindsight view, but embodiment has always been a theme before it became a theme in the last, you know, I, not even 10 years. Um, it's become a theme in scholarship. It's become a theme publicly because of ta Coates' book, um, Between the World and Me. It's become a theme within um, religion as well because a lot of religious um, scholars have written about it and I think it's become a broader cultural theme because of practices that we've, um, I wanna say, some people will say appropriated, borrowed, been invited into in many cases like um, Eastern medicine and yoga and other kinds of spirituality require us to be in touch with our bodies in ways that I think in a materialistic Western culture again, me speaking from my experience living in the States as Western, um, that we are so disconnected from. So um, the, the raced and bodied part, I've always known because I've carried around the pain of my ancestors for my entire life. And so as a little girl growing up in Oklahoma on expropriated land, because we're all squatters on someone else's land, anyone in this country. Um, and so having an awareness of that from a young age and then having an awareness of the fact that I'm black and that means I needed to make myself small, like not stand out, not be too loud because that's what they expect black people to be. Or my friends who um, are louder than me and I just always happen to be quiet, but it's hard to know, did I become quiet because I thought I was supposed to? Was I born this way? I'm not quiet anymore. But, you know, 
it's hard to know. I used to walk around looking at the ground as a little kid. I used to mumble. I still mumble sometimes because I was supposed to, not in the way of people say, old folks say children are to be seen and not heard. Um, black people are supposed to be invisible to society, even though we stand out. So we're hyper visible, yet when it comes to being, to standing in a line and every white person cuts in front of you as though you aren't there, like, oh, I didn't see you. I'm hyper visible, yet I'm invisible. You can't help but think about your body, the work that your body does for you without you opening your mouth. The fact that people don't recognize you for who you are, they've already decided who you, you and your entire group are, right? Um, so there's this representation that's happening without me representing myself. Um, and it became very acute when I went to Wheaton College. When I, what happened is, this is one of the, the best examples, I think. Um, it's my, it's the year, it's the semester before I'm to submit my tenure file. Mm -hmm. And we are at a required faculty seminar. So kids are out of school for the day and all the faculty are convening and listening to someone that they've brought in to speak about a book that they bought for us all to read so that we could talk for three hours about said book and then, you know, nothing changes institutionally. This is a familiar story at every school, not just me. So faculty development days. Um, and I am getting my sandwich at the table like everyone else. And a faculty member that I have met no less than four times mistakes me for the help. Like the people who work in the, in the cafeteria, yeah. which is fine. It's not offensive to me because guess what? I know all of their names because I speak to them. But he only wants to know where the mustard is. Yeah. And if I could go get some for him. And so the acuteness, and that's only one example. And if I kept track of all of them, I'd be crazy. But it's not just microaggressions that add up and add up and add up. Um, I was telling a friend today, like being black in the United States is, is all of that. And it's, you have to scream that into the wind or the ether because no one hears you anyway. And no one would believe it and no one cares. It's just part, it's the tax and the burden. And so at some point, the burden, your body can't, it can't carry it. So I started getting high blood pressure when I was at Wheaton. And my doctor knew, she was like, you're not overweight. You don't. I said, do I need to lose weight? She said, no, you don't need to lose weight. What do I do? I exercise. You can't exercise more. She's like, this is your job. She's a white woman. She was like, it's that very monochromatic institution that you work at. She's not my therapist. She's my, she's my, you know, general practitioner telling me your job is too stressful. It's too stressful to be a black woman in a white space. I never said that to her, but my doctor knew. That's the price. So the embodiment of race and, and the epigenetic research that we know now, now know about, which every Black person I knew already knew that's where our hypertension came from, right? Um, and similar stories of epigenetics within um, evidence within survivors and um, descendants of Holocaust, right? So it's that. It's the way that we know that bodies and race um, do all of this political speaking to people. And that's all we see on the news right now. Right. It's all that we see. Uh, thank you. I'm conscious of the time. I want to, to look at some of the questions coming in on the chat. Um, one that jumps out that I think is, is a lovely one um, reflects on you as a teacher. I think you, you started off talking about pedagogy at the beginning of the conversation and um, being justice as a concept. And so have you found that making these types of connections with your students at UVA and at Wheaton um, that has allowed them to give voice to what being justice means to them? Have they been able to look at their own faith in new ways in your courses? 
Yes, um, thanks for the question. Um, students, I would say, number one, if they take my classes, I mean, at Wheaton, I had been there long enough that I had a reputation. What was scary about the Peace and Conflict Studies class was it was the first iteration. So it was a lot of freshmen and one person that I knew who was an upperclassman and an art major and he's accustomed to thinking in radical ways about scholarship and embodiment and expressions of that. Um, and I didn't want it just to be again from here. So I wanted there to be an experiential component of the program and which was a challenge for me because I do live here and I'm a perfectionist and um, so learning to say I am an artist right mm -hmm. um, and being vulnerable so I require my students to this semester um, and this was before we went online to do a not a paper project right and it's hard for them because they would rather do a paper <laughs> they would rather write a treatise or a thesis than do art yeah really but at the end on the last day of my class raising the obama presidency we connected it like how do we connect the obama moment to the trump moment how do we get from the first black president eight years in office to we're i'm in charlottesville virginia remember yeah. where heather Heyer was yeah. murdered where neo-nazis chanted jews will not replace us in 2017 and um they can't help but well if they haven't thought about how connected this is to the zeitgeist of the time and reflective of their generation i make them and there were there were just these beautiful um, 80 this was my big class 80 beautiful expressions of art poetry um zines which is a fancy name for a flip book online right yeah. um and some less some you know less developed artists but beautiful expressions of vulnerability and um so it's an honor when students do that when they trust you enough to go there so yeah. It's hard for all of us to be vulnerable and humble and, and sort of engage in those virtues when we're going into spaces that tend to be dominated by um, a certain type of academic thinking. So yes. it's a, yes. a beautiful thing to bring into the classroom. Um, I'm just looking at another question. It kind of jumps in, in, in a different direction, um, talking a little bit about the theology. Um, and I, I, I think the, the, there's a couple on this, so I want to make space for it here. Um, in the film, you point out uh, at the very beginning that neither Jews nor Muslims believe that Jesus is God. Yet most Christians have no difficulty in saying that Jews and Christians worship the same God, but a lot of Christians have trouble saying that Christians and Muslims worship the same God, which is also presumably what the Wheaton administration mm -hmm. uh, found to be problematic and sort of, but I, I think that that juxtaposition in the Abrahamic conversation, and you, you said this in the film, highlights that the divinity of Jesus is not necessarily the fact that is the, is the issue. Um, it, there's other stuff that's going on. Um, and, I'm just wondering if you can sort of speak broadly, about, you could speak to the particular about the theology or more broadly about how you view theological agreement and political solidarity mm -hmm. um, and whether or not there has to be theological agreement in order to inform it, what's sort of gained and what's lost. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, I think that, that, that that's something that I, I think that several folks are, are wondering about. Yeah. Well, I'll focus a little on Islam for a second because um, I've spent a lot of time in, in various um, mus types of Muslim communities um, across the world, in fact. Um, and one of the things that is interesting is this isn't just a broad, um, let's start with Judaism, Muslim, Kind of Christian divergence. It's also uh, there's a Muslim 
divergence. So within Islam, varieties of belief. Right. Um, within Judaism, varieties of belief. And I'm not talking political belief. Um, I'm talking theological belief. And within Christianity, obviously. Um, I, yeah, and even just earlier, we were talking high church, low church, and various right. forms of worship, and how yeah. we all understand the Trinity a little bit differently. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes those various forms of worship map onto different ideas about God, salvation, not even talking about the divinity of Jesus, um, or what salvation means within Christianity, and saved for what, and to what, and in what way. Um, and it's dizzying. And in my estimation, when I'm talking about something as, as um, what I believe is universal as embodiment and solidarity, it gets to the heart of a teaching that we all share, which is this notion of the sacrality of humans. Um, from dust we come and to dust we shall return. We share in life and death and suffering. We share in our humanity. Um, I am because we are. I can't exist apart from the broader human community. And so I love the expressions in, in Islam, again, my bad Arabic, of um, the umma, the U-M-M-A-H, um, as I translate it from into English, I mean, that in every setting um, in which I've walked into a community of, of predominantly Muslims, I've been accepted as a sister. And a little boy asked me once, he raised his hand at the end of um, a session in what I think of as kind of, um, and I've heard this from my Muslim friends, like kind of the Mecca of um, of Muslims in the ISIS, Dearborn, Michigan. I'm literally there on the, on the border between Dearborn and Detroit. I think the Detroit mosque is on the Dearborn side. Um, and a little boy raises his hand after I'm speaking. And this is kind of in the throes of like, right after all the trauma of leaving Wheaton. And he said, he, he waited to the very end. Last question. He said, when are you going to become Muslim? And I said, I feel like I'm already your sister. I'm already part of the Ummah. And so, um, I think Allah is God. Um, Abraham is our shared father. And that's the level of agreement that I'm talking about. And the particulars I'll leave to folks to fight out. Um, embodied solidarity is about not transcending those differences. It's about saying what is primary and utmost is the humanity that lays at the core, um, the Imago Dei, um, the fact that if there is a God, God is one. So, so here's a, another question. Um, uh, I went to an institution very similar to Wheaton and since saw the distinction at religiously affiliated higher eds of being seen as bigoted or prejudiced in some way. But I've also experienced secular higher ed environments and cultures that made prejudicial assumptions about faculty and students. Um, and so I think, I mean, I think that it's driving at, if I'm, if I'm understanding the questioner correctly, sort of you, you've taught in a religious institution like Wheaton, and now you're at UVA, which is a, a secular state institution. Can you talk about the sort of blind spots and the, and the prejudices that you've experienced in both institutional settings? Sure. Um, I was speaking once at UVA to a group of students, and a student raised his hand and said, why would you teach at an institution like that? Shouldn't you, basically, shouldn't you have known better, right? Mm. Um, the UVA student assuming. talking about Wheaton, right? Yes. Okay. yes, sorry, thank you. A UVA student talking about Wheaton. And um, assuming at the heart of his question, this notion that Wheaton can only be bigoted and backwards and despite, you know, the the rich intellectual tradition there, um, and a wonderful spiritual heritage there. Um, and I said, well, let me tell you what Wheaton has that UVA doesn't have. UVA is explicitly committed to 
developing developing citizens, right? To developing like, not in the like Republican marching soldier sense. There's no explicit partisanship to Wheaton, although you can guess what the preponderance of the board of trustees might be, who they might, uh, how they might bend. Um, but I don't even know how they bend. Like that's, this isn't an, um, there's, not a, there's not a political litmus test. Um, the faculty, I would say, actually lean more to the left at Wheaton like considerably more to the left. And students are pretty mixed. And um, it's not liberty, although people think it is nowadays. And so that being said, I said, I can tell you that you all venerate Thomas Jefferson, but what Wheaton does is explicitly committed to the intellectual life, of the mind, of the body, of the spirit, of the whole person. And that's not a commitment of UVA, mm. but that's a commitment of mine. So I, I tell my students in my class, and this is something that I would say at a Christian school. And when I came here, I thought, how is my teaching going to change? Well, my students already know I'm a Christian because if you Google my name, a New York Times article <laughs> comes up. <laughs> yes. So when students Google their, their teachers these days, right? So, um, so yeah, I said, I care um, more about who you are are and who you're becoming, then I care about what you make in my class. And I mean that. Now I hope they learn. I want to be a challenging professor. I expect a high level of engagement. But I'm developing humans. Period. Yeah. yeah. And I'm becoming because I learn from them. They keep me accountable to be justice. I can't teach about justice and not be justice. So um, so we've got that agreement and it's similar. I might express it differently than I would at Wheaton, but I think they can both learn from one another, right? So. Uh, con conscious of the time, I wanna share with you one comment that came in um, and then ask a, a final question. Um, so this is a, a comment from someone on the call today. I personally want to say thank you for your incredible courage. As an American Muslim, I often feel alone. My community, which is about 1% of the US population, has been scared and continues to be scared. Like one of the Wheaton students said in your film, this is the worst time in America for Muslims, even more challenging for us than in post 9-11. So your bravery in speaking up has given us hope. Thank you. Mm -hmm. a wonderful, a wonderful comment. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and my final question, as, a, 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 as an academic who studies religion, what is the one thing that you wish everybody knew about religion? Oh, <laughs> that, that is a zinger. She didn't tell me she was going to ask me that question. Oh, no, I'd like to keep that one a surprise, so. Um, <laughs> I really, um, Here's the one thing I know, I know the answer already, because this is also something I tell my students. I was gonna say something else, but I'm gonna say this. Um, and interestingly, I think I'm preaching to the choir because of who you all are, but I believe rich religion um, really is one of the few um, spaces and places as it, as it is expressed communally, whether that's in groups like ICG, ICJS, um, mosques, churches, synagogues, temples, etc. cetera, um, on campuses. There are these instantiations of students who have religious backgrounds who all of a sudden come to university and they, they miss that, right? And so they form these students, student groups or never went to mosque much at home, but the new Muslim chaplain is really popular here, right, at UVA, um, that they're there are resources that you get from being part of a religious community, right? Um, that you're hard pressed to find anywhere else. Um, growing up in a black church, one of my earliest memories is a funeral. It was my great grandfather. So I know my earliest funeral was at four years old. When I was in college, a lot of my friends didn't know what to do when one of our, when our first friend's parent died. You know, um, so I was like, oh, you bake a cake. If you can go to the funeral, you go. You embody presence, right? 
um, whether you knew them or not, it doesn't matter. Um, we have showers, we have, you know, we celebrate weddings, we celebrate babies, we celebrate funerals. Um, I know people across a range of life experiences and circumstances. I've been in predominantly white churches, predominantly black churches, multi-ethnic churches that were trying to also be multi-class and multi-ethnic churches that did not care that it was predominantly wealthy people who looked like one another and were comfortable. But religion, if we have um, a kind of shared spiritual commitment, even if we disagree about theological particulars, referencing that last question, a previous question, um, we agree about some of the highest order things like the dignity of our humanity should be central or that love of neighbor and love of self, love of God or the universe should be central. That the lifeblood um, that we rape and pillage each other because we're raping and pillaging the earth, right? That what sustains us is bigger than our individual narcissistic expressions of materiality, that there is more than this, whatever we believe about souls and bodies after we die. Um, and I think that is the great bequeathment of religion and these kind of forms of spirituality to the world is that bringing us back to our essence. And, um, and again, this is what I'm trying to be in the classroom. And my students aren't offended and they don't think I'm preaching. And I get that from religion. And, and that's what I think. Um, that's what I love. Um, that we're all on a journey. And I believe all of us are on a spiritual journey. Um, and that the more we commit to being on that journey, the more we commit to humanity and the universe and, and caring for that. And, and again, that's the soul work that we need to do is to be intentional um, about something. So. Religion holds me accountable to that, yeah. and the, or, or religious communities. I, you know, I want to distinguish between dogmatic religion and, you know, the best parts of those kinds of communities is what I push for my students. So. Uh, Larisha, thank you so much for being with us today, for um, your your work and being justice in the world, for your sharing, for your passion. Um, I, we learned so much from you. I'm so grateful, so glad that our paths crossed that many years ago and so grateful to be able to see you again. Um, oh, I you. wanted to let folks on the call know there are two, two kind of next steps. Um, if you had a solidarity story that you wanted to share, the samegodfilm.com has a, a place that you can do that um, and they're collecting stories. And so if you wanted to go to, to samegodfilm.com to share your solidarity story, please do. Um, and the other thing, again, for folks who may not be on the ICJS mailing list, um, we invite you to opt in. And so you can come to future events that we do to, to raise religious and interreligious literacy and to really think about the big questions that are impacting us today. So again, Larisha, thank you so much. Okay. I think everyone's muted, but hopefully we can do a- Can a I say one thing to Baltimore? Yeah. Uh, you guys are, I think Baltimore is an integral part of my own story because hmm. in the final moments before Wheaton and I parted ways, um, that February, I believe early February was when Obama visited Baltimore, um, yeah. the mosque. Um, and the, you know, Freddie Gray um, events had transpired and they gripped the world. It, it gripped me in the way that George Floyd is gripping the world now. So I think of, I'm thinking of Baltimore. I'm thinking of you all who have experienced that pain publicly, who have, um, have been let down, um, my Muslim brothers and sisters, by this country. Um, in the same way that folks are racist, they're Islamophobic, and I think calling it fear is nice because I, th I think it's more than like we let people off the hook when we say fear. Um, the rise in anti-Semitism, I'm aware of these things and um, any ways that I can be in solidarity with Baltimore. We've known each other now for almost three whole years and we've been talking about getting together. So it's really a pleasure to finally 
be with Baltimore even from a distance. I do think this is embodied solidarity, even though we're online, because <laughs> I know, I think Heather and I's intent was for us to be together someday yes. in person. Um, so please receive my expression of love and namaste, bowing to the divine in all of you, um, whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larisha. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Be safe, be well, and be justice. Yes. Amen. <laughs>